Thank you very much, Bob, for, for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here um, with Dr. Mike Wilson in the, in the room. That is a little bit scary. But uh, anyway, the idea is um, to go on. There are wonderful presentations. We talk about a little bit about Strap Swiss, very nice research going on in here in Guelph. Um, so I decide, because I don't have enough time to talk about everything on Strep Suisse, everything that I know, but the idea is just to point out what I believe now is maybe the most important point. I guess most of you know Strep Suisse is one of the most important, it is probably considered the most important bacterial pathogen during the nursery meningitis, septicemia, you know that. Um, what is important probably to mention is uh, that there is not necessarily a primary uh, involvement in pneumonia. It's not necessarily considered a first pathogen in pneumonia. We are going to come back on this. There are 35 serotypes of strep suis. Most of them have been described in our labs and most of them badly described because it seems that they are not strep suis, some of them. And the serotype 2 is considered the most important serotype worldwide and is also a zoonosis <laughs> affecting people. And the serotype 2 is the, the, the most important. Uh, there has been a survey that has been um, done late in 2018. Um, and this survey was done with most practitioners and scientists working on swine diseases about which is the most important bacterial disease today that people are dealing with. And the first place, it appeared Strep Suisse. When I began my PhD many years ago on Strep Suisse, my supervisor, Dr. Robert Higgins, he told me, if you wish, you can work on this as a sideline. It's not necessarily an important disease. It was not an important disease at that moment. And I kept working on that. So at the end, now it seems to be it's a little bit more important. The question is, is really now coming back? We believe that strep suisse is, is always there, has always been there. It has been mentioned today by one of the students that more than 90% of pigs are carriers of strep suisse. I believe that 100% of pigs are carriers. The 10% probably we miss the, 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 the strep suisse, but it has always been there. And if you take a look to the rate of publications, you will see that between 2005 and 2006, the number of publications went up very, very fast on a strep suisse. And that why? That was a consequence of a human outbreak. That's when the world realized that the strep suisse may be something important. That was in the summer of 2005, with more than 50 people, documented 50 people that, uh, that were dead in a very short period of time, with meningitis and also what was called the toxic shock syndrome. In Thailand and Vietnam, this infection in, in, in humans is the one of the most important in, in, in adult people. Just to give you an example, in Thailand, we are working very close collaboration with them. In the three first month of this year, there have been more than 330 human cases with 30 people dying of strep suisse in those countries. When, when the outbreak in China began, the Chinese researcher, the CDC, contact us and they asked us for help because they didn't know the bacteria. And uh, you can see here in the picture, this is uh, Dr. Mariela Segura, is our immunologist. She's also my wife, and she spent two months over there helping the Chinese to identify the strain and to look why these people were dying so, uh, so, so fast. Then you can see this is a case. This person survived. You can see here the lesions of a toxic shock-like syndrome caused by a strep suisse. This, this is an, in Vietnam. OK. But if going back, what happened in pigs with the strep suisse? I mentioned that serotype 2, which is the zoonotic one, is the most important in most countries in the world. And if you take a look of the percentage, you can see it's a dominant serotype when we are talking of strains coming from disease animals. 
However, the situation, I don't know if you can read it, but situation is completely different here in North America. In Quebec, each time that um, an animal is uh, sent to the lab for necropsy, either a provincial lab or the university, if there is a strep suite isolated and it is considered playing an important role, automatically the strain is sent to my lab for serotyping and characterization. So we receive all strains of strep suis coming from diseased animal, which seems to be important. And you can see here that there is only 10% of strains that are serotype 2, and then you have other serotypes like uh, serotype 1-2, that means a serotype that shares antigen with serotype 1 and 2, serotype uh, 3, 4, serotype 7, which is also important, and serotype 9. So there is a bunch of different serotypes affecting our pigs here in Canada. So the situation is very different, and we will see why we see that kind of difference. Um, there are other, other serotypes. In blue here, there are the strains, the serotypes, sorry, that are not longer considered true strep suis, and some of them are still being isolated from diseased pigs. So we still consider the 35 serotypes as possible causes of, of disease in pigs. I'm trying to help you, you don't, don't read. This, we have just finished a collaboration with Minnesota because there was almost no data from the United States. And as you can see here, uh, this distribution of these serotypes are um, mainly, sorry, they are mainly serotype 1-2. It's not, you cannot see the, the arrow, but it's serotype 1-2. Then you have also serotype 7, serotype 5, 4. Also you have serotype 2, but it's very similar to what we observe here, at least in Quebec bunch of different serotypes present and not a predominant serotype as it is the case in most European countries. If you go to human cases in Europe are very common and are very rarely found here in North America. There are probably seven, eight cases that have been reported and one of the causes is perhaps we have less cases of serotype 2, and we will see probably some serotype 2 strains are less virulent. We can do other things in addition to serotyping, and that is um, studied by uh, multilocal sequence typing, MLST, to compare these serotype 2 strains, because there are genetic differences among the strains. As you can see here, in Europe and Asia, the serotype 2 strains are what we call sequence type 1, which are really, really virulent. The sequence type 7, this caused the epidemic, in, the outbreak in, in, in China and humans, it's very close to that. But our strains are here, which are far from the European strains. So we have sequence type 1, uh, then we have sequence type 25, and sequence type 28. So, we believe that we, that we were very um, smart. We say, okay, we perform experimental infections, which is not easy to perform with the strep suisse. And that experimental infection show that the, that, good, that was okay, this, the ST1 from Europe, very virulent, the ST25 from Canada, more or less virulent, and ST28, we could never reproduce disease with this sequence type. So we said this sequence type, ST28, is non-virulent. We published that. Well, let's see. So we said serotype ST1 in Europe, more virulent, so probably more human cases also, serotype 2. North America, we have ST25 and ST28. The problem is, and I will help you here to see the, the data, is when we see the sequence type and serotypes that, that are described, we we'll see, okay, the different serotypes that I mentioned, but you will see that serotype 1-2, which is the most common serotype in Canada presently and also in USA, are ST28, the sequence type that we believe 
is not virulent. Then we have a serotype 14, which is ST1, virulent. Some serotype 1, also ST1, and the serotype 2 strains, ST28 and ST25. So this is in the United States. So we began to think, OK, this is not so clear. The ST1 strains, these are virulent and may be major cause of disease in a farm. But the other ones, we are not very clear. So serotype 2 strains from Canada are very different from those of uh, Europe and Asia. The experimental infection do not always reflect the reality. The problem is that you have your piglets in a room with a five-star hotel, very nice condition. You infect the animals. Eight times out of ten, the animals look at you, and they are completely healthy. Nothing happened. But these strains in the farm are causing a lot, a lot of problems. MLST results show that serotype 2 may give some indication. The ST1 strains, and I'm talking about that because I'm talking in a few seconds of diagnosis, and labs are able now to perform that kind of differentiation. The ST1 strains present higher virulence. ST28 and ST25, they are potentially virulent. And we should pay attention to ST1 strain of serotype 1, 2, and 14. Now are 20% of the strains recovered, either in USA or in Canada. And these strains are highly virulent. First, the strains are highly pathogenic for pigs and also with a zoonotic potential. So, we have different strains, very difficult situation in Canada when you have to pick up the strains responsible for virulence. And I, the, at the end of my talk, we will talk about vaccines. We will talk about autogenous vaccines that are widely used in North America and also in Europe. But everything begins to pick up the right strain. If you do not have the right strain, a vaccine will never work. And to pick up the right strain of a strep suisse is really difficult. Why? Again, a strep suisse is a normal inhabitant. This normal inhabitant may live for a long time in the tonsils, and all of a sudden, and without not necessarily a known reason, one strain may invade and cause disease. So, the best thing to say is, OK, we detect virulent factors, so we can identify which strain is virulent, and we can use that strain on an autogenous vaccine. The problem is it's very strange for a strep suisse, and this is a message especially for graduate students, where you do not have to believe everything that is published, because Presently, in the case of strep suisse, there are a lot of confusion. We published a paper about that, but there is a controversy on the virulent factor. Which is the definition of a virulent factor, especially for a strep suisse? Uh, a virulent factor is uh, the base, uh, it's based on the strain that has been isolated for a diseased animal, or is a strain that expresses this virulent factor in, a, in an animal model or in vitro test. And how many critical virulent factors have been proposed? Over 60. What's the meaning of critical virulent factor? That means that you take out this single virulent factor and a strep suisse is not longer pathogen, which is strange. Uh, most of them have been uh, used isogenic mutants and, and many of these factors with overlap functions. So you have an adesine. But you, the bacteria has, I don't know, 15 different adesins for the same receptor. And to take out one adesin, it is strange that the strain is no longer virulent because the other adesin should replace that. And the problem is most of them have not been validated. We have published, I will not go into detail, we have published, we, we have a student that he amused himself to take published data on virulent factor, construct the same mutants, from the same strains, use the same model, and he couldn't observe any decrease in virulence. 
The models that have been used for Strepsuis go from pigs to the amoeba in vitro system to evaluate the virulence. And when we are talking about pigs, can we use CD, CD pigs? Yes, very susceptible, but very far from the reality. Conventional pigs, SPF uh, pigs, and why is the, by intravenous infection, intranasal infection, intraperitoneal infection, everybody, everybody is using a different way. The problem is today, if you go for some places when they want to say, okay, this is a virulent strain causing problems in your herd, we say we are going for whole genome sequencing. We have all genome, and we look for the virulent factor that have been published and to say if these virulent factors are present or not. Again, this is dangerous. Why is dangerous? This is one example. For example, this is a paper coming that says there is an AGA protease, an enzyme that will degrade AGA in, in the mucosa, as a very important virulent factor for the strep suis. And, and it has been published that you have here the AGA, you put with the strep suis, this protein that is a, an enzyme, and you, you have two bands because it has been cut. And this has been published as a critical virulent factor. We identified that this IgA protease was a different protein with a different function, nothing to do with EGI protease, and we repeat the same thing. This is a positive control which has been uh, degraded, but this is with the strep suis. There is no degradation at all. So strep suis do not produce any e IgA protease, but you go to the literature and you will find hundreds of data of different virulent factors that unfortunately could not be confirmed. And these add a lot of confusion to the definition of how can we know the strain is virulent. The answer, most of the time, we don't know. And we don't have any tool to know if the strain is virulent or not. The only Virulent factor that has been demonstrated, clear demonstrated by different groups, is the capsule. The capsule gives the serotype. But the problem is for serotype 2, you have virulent and low virulent strains. All of them are encapsulated with the same capsule. So it's not a good way. There are other virulent markers that have been described. The emolysin is a toxin that is affecting the cells. And two proteins doesn't matter the, the role, but there are two proteins, and these three factors have been related with virulence and have been used only for the European Asian virulence strain, the HT1 strain that I mentioned before. And these strains are highly virulent, are positive for these factors. So instead of doing the MLST, where you have strains of is the one which are really virulent, um, can only be used for serotonin 1 and 14. We can do a PCR, and that can be offered for different labs, a PCR that will detect these factors. If these factors are present for a serotype 2, 1, or 14 strain, it's an ST1 like an European strain, and it will be virulent. The problem is for the other serotype 2, most of them from North America, the result may be variable. Serotype 1 2, which is the most important serotype in Canada and USA, we don't know, we don't have anything, and we don't have anything for other serotype either. So we are in the dark. It's very difficult for us in North America to tell in a given farm when a strain is highly virulent, other than a serotype 2, 1, or 14 ST1, very difficult to say this is the strain causing a primary problem due to a strep suis. So that's, that's the problem why if we have different strains in a farm, we would like to reduce the use of antibiotic. It's coming, it's already there in Europe, and it's coming more and more here. And you say, okay, 
So far, the only way to control strep psoas is by the use of antibiotics. Let's go to the vaccines. And if you take a look at this graphic, this is the number of uh, publication of vaccines of strep psoas is not so high. There's no so many papers on, the, on vaccines. And as you can see, there are subunit vaccines, live vaccines, and then you have bacterines. All of them are experimental. And the, everybody's looking for a vaccine, how to do to control this disease, when in the first part I mentioned that it's already difficult to have a very good diagnosis if we have a primary problem due to a strep suisse. So the bacterines, commercial, there is only one, it's not registered here in North America. You have an autogenous vaccine, we'll come back on this, subunit vaccine and live vaccine. Since I do not have the time to talk about all of them, I have talked about those that are being used today in the field, which are autogenous vaccines. Please remember, when we talk about autogenous vaccine, it's a vaccine based on the strain that has been isolated in a farm. Okay? And I mentioned before, that it's extremely difficult to identify the viral strain in the farm. So the beginning is already a problem. If you don't have the right strain, it will never work. But let's say if we have the right strain, it, is this working? There are two ways of giving the toxinous vaccine. Have the toxinous vaccine in piglets, the toxinous vaccine in sows. Strep suisse is affecting piglets between, let's say, three, four weeks of age until seven, eight weeks of age. And the nursery, typical nursery problem. If you have to vaccinate piglets, you have to vaccinate very early. So one of the problems of vaccinated piglets is, is there any maternal antibody interference? Are these antibodies against the proteins? Are non-specific against other streps? The level of antibodies against the capsule, we demonstrate that these are the antibodies which are protective. The only problem is animals do not produce almost antibodies against the capsule. So probably we do not know exactly which kind of antibodies this autogenous vaccine will be producing. How many doses we have to give to the piglets? the adjuvant that needs to be used. There are a lot of unknown information still there about the use of autogenous vaccines. So people say it's complicated, we will vaccinate sows. Just to give you an example, 20% of the sows in France and the Netherlands are presently being vaccinated with an strep suisse autogenous vaccines. I don't know if you can figure out the number of doses that that represents, it's huge. Because people said, if vaccination of piglets is complicated, we will vaccinate sows. But now we are vaccinating sows to give antibodies to the piglets, which will be affected at six, seven weeks of age. So we will see the question is how this vaccination may control the infection. Maybe useful to, to control in young piglet, but how that I mentioned how long the maternal antibodies are there. Usually animals will be vaccinated six, seven weeks uh, prepartum and they will booster three weeks later. Um, in the next cycle, they will receive only one boost. That's the game of giving one boost before each farrowing period. As mentioned, very popular. And in some cases, they say that it works. The problem is, we will see, you never have control groups. You go to a farm to vaccinate everybody, and it seems to go better. Which may be true. I'm not saying it's not true. But it's, you know, scientifically, from the scientific point of view, it's, it's difficult. Very, very few, few studies in, in, the, in the field without, uh, as I mentioned, without a control group. 
Uh, and the, also the problem when you go to the farm is that they introduce an autogenous vaccine. At the same time, they introduce other modifications. Because, you know, when they arrive, they say, okay, we are going to modify this, this. The... You never know if the autogenous vaccine is responsible for these changes. And we have some experience of that, that you work a lot in autogenous vaccine, you arrive at the disease disappear alone. And we never know why. So this is the way that most studies, usually presentations in Congress, will present. Total mortality will be pre-vaccination, post-vaccination. Decrease, anti antimicrobial use, pre-vaccination, post-vaccination. And I'm not saying this is not correct. It is difficult to have an, um, a correlation, a clear correlation between the use of the autogenous vaccine and this data without having uh, a control group. So we decided to test in the field with an autogenous vaccine produced by a company to see for the first time is there any antibody production against the vaccine? Because nobody measure the production of antibodies. So we went to a south herd, a close herd, with serious problems with the strep suis in the nursery. This was a stereotype seven. Um, and we have two approaches at different time, not at the same time. Piglet vaccination, sow vaccination. We'll begin with the sow vaccination. What we did is we gave two doses, as usually used, um, before following. Uh, we measure the response, antibody response, and we follow the antibody response in the piglet from vaccinated and from non-vaccinated sows. What would you observe? First thing, this is the total, what we use as an antigen was the vaccine. The, the, the bacteria used in the, in the autogenous vaccine. The first thing that we observe, I put here in red, this is 10,000, a dilution of 10,000. What does that mean? We dilute 10,000 times SEDA from the south, and they were still positive. The first conclusion is that all sows present a huge amount of antibody levels before vaccination. You never see clinical cases in adult animals of strep suis, never. So, very or, already very high, this is the control group, this is the vaccinated group. There is a slight increase in the vaccinated group in the tighter of the south. So it's inducing a little bit of antibody response, statistically significant, but not quite a lot. And that is because it was already very high. What happened in the piglets? The transfer of maternal antibody. You see, this is our vaccinated, this is our control. So the first thing that we see at one week of age is that that difference that we observe in vaccinated sows are not longer observed in piglet from vaccinated or non-vaccinated sows. The levels are exactly the same, similar to the sows and exactly the same. Take a look at three weeks old. The antibodies disappeared. We were not able to detect the antibodies anymore. Obviously, five weeks old, they were still negative. So at this age, five weeks old, animals began to present clinical disease. I do not have the result for the clinical disease because just arrived last week, they were already analyzed. It was not difference between the mortality and morbidity or the use of antibiotic between the control and, and vaccinated group. Then we say, okay, we measure the antibodies by ELISA. And the ELISA is measuring, you know, general antibodies. So we said, can we study the um, functional effect of these antibodies? And so we develop a test, which is an interesting test. If you put strep suis in blood without antibodies, strep suis is not destroyed, it's very resistant. So the uh, cells, monocyte, neutrophyte that are in the blood are not able to kill strep suis. 
if you add good antibodies, there will be opsonization, then the cells will take the bacteria and destroy it. That, that's what called opsonophagocytosis. So what we did is we took the strain from the vaccine, the live strep suisse, serum from vaccinated animals or non-vaccinated animals, and we took blood from a negative, a normal pig, giving the cells. So if we have antibodies from the vaccinated group here, they will react with the strain and the leukocyte will destroy the strep suisse. It's a killing test. We see the, these antibodies are, are able to kill. The sows, 100% killing. So the antibodies in the sow, either vaccinated or not vaccinated, already have a potential to kill all the strep suisse. And one week old, still relatively high, but take a look, already a five weeks old, there is no difference between control and vaccinated piglets. And most of the piglets reduce the killing ability of, of, of the sera, which has a relatively good correlation with the lysa test. So the piglets, a five weeks old, did not have antibodies against strep suisse, most of them, and the low level of antibodies that they have were not able to kill bacteria. So we do not have, so far, any explanation why these animals will be protected by vaccinated sows. So limit antibody response. I did not present the result dominated by the subtype of IgG1, is the type of immunoglobulin, the less important for strep suisse. We like to have IgG2, which are opsonic, but that was very, very low. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, it's not increased after so vaccination, the level in the, in the piglets, and the protective capacity was, was not very high. What happened when we vaccinate piglets? As the sow vaccination didn't work, say, okay, we are going to try what happened if we vaccinate piglets. The sows were not vaccinated, only the piglets. So we decided to give the first dose on one week old, and the second dose at three week old, the piglet. Try to have enough time for the conversion and protection at five, six weeks of age. These are the, the, the number that they present here are the number of animals that we follow up by serology. But the total number of animals in the control or vaccinated group was much higher. In blue, vaccinated, gray, non-vaccinated. The same picture that I showed you before, but that's okay because it's the first week when we vaccinate the animals. Th third week, did you go here? Okay, sorry. The, the week, third week of age, five and eight week. It's the same graphic that I present you before. It's not the same graphic, but the same picture that we see in the previous graphic with the vaccination of sows. That means maternal antibodies coming down and we couldn't observe any increase in antibody response in piglets after two doses of the vaccine. I present here very badly. There is no difference on IgG1, IgG2 or IgM. We, we, we look for all subclasses of immunoglobulins, we didn't see any difference. When we went for a uh, opsophagocytosis test to see if the capacity of these antibodies to kill bacteria, very similar high in the first week and then very low in the following weeks. So we couldn't demonstrate production of antibodies or killing effect of the antibodies by sow vaccination, but we couldn't also demonstrate by piglet vaccination. Piglets already have a high level of maternal antibodies, not increase in antibodies. Uh, the duration it didn't change, and the protective capacity was not very high. Can this be applied to all autogenous vaccines? In fact, we should be careful. 
because we need more uh, control and field scientific studies with control groups to really evaluate the bacteria. First, we need to be sure that the diagnosis was well done. In the cases that I present, the diagnosis was well done. The adjuvant that the autogenous vaccine may use is, is probably extremely important. The bacterial concentration used in the vaccine may be also important. Is there any interference with maternal antibodies? And this was the, why the piglets did not answer to the vaccination. And can this vaccine be used in sows? Can we get scientifically proven data that vaccination in sows may work? And one of the questions to be solved is perhaps vaccination for sows are not changing the antibody response, but are decreasing the strep Swiss shedding. And all these aspects that are presented here in this slide are going to be tested in the following month by, um, by, by our laboratory. So the question is this as well, I'd like to thank to, uh, to, to, to the people and money, we'll come back on that, but the, the question is what, and I guess probably you will have the question, what should I do? Should we use the autogenous vaccines? I, I don't know. Because we still need, some, sometimes it's the only tool that you may have. So when practitioner asked me that, I said, you may try. Why not? I mean, it's, it's not going to, it will not harm, but it's very difficult to say today that the autogenous vaccine are giving good results. On the other point is you have different autogenous vaccines, you have to pay attention to the diagnosis. It's a very complicated. The problem is, um, Unless we can arrive with other non-antibiotic measures that can control the infection, is the only tool that people have, but so far it's a poorly developed tool. And we need more and more work on that. Just to mention here that um, uh, we have money from different sources, and I would like to also to thank Ontario Pork. I, we, Ontario Pork, uh, that's very nice because we have not used money from Ontario Pork for the data that I present to you today, but we are going to use the money from Ontario Pork to validate the last slide that I mentioned, if we can change the way of using the vaccine, if the adjuvant or other effect can improve the use of the vaccine. And it's very kind from Ontario Pork to, to give money to people working in Quebec, sometimes, you know, uh, how to say it, uh, sometimes it's not easy for us, even in Quebec, to get money from Quebec producers. So it's, um, it's a really, really, really thanks to Ontario Power for this collaboration. Um, Lorelei is the student who performed all the tests for, for the autogenous vaccine test. Sonia is my research assistant for the first part of characterization of isolate, and also uh, Marty and Beasley for uh, her help in the testing in, in, in the field. And if you have any question, I'm ready for you.